Hello, in this short video I'd like to talk a bit more about the kind of things you might encounter in quantitative research methods that can be a bit annoying. In particular, there's violations of all the different assumptions, there's biases that you can have, different outliers, anomalies, so I'd like to talk a bit more on what you can do about this. But let's first go a bit into the different assumptions. So parametric tests are typically based on the normal distribution, so they assume that you have additivity and linearity, normality, something or other, homogeneity of variances, and some kind of independence. So let's go a bit more into the typical assumptions for a parametric test. So one is that you really have to have a continuous dependent variable, so you may measure it. So the variable should be interval or ratio level, that means they should really be continuous and not just nominal or normal. Another aspect is additivity and linearity. As mentioned before, there should be independence of the different observations. That means that for between subject designs, no participant should really be in more than one of the different groups. The data should, of course, be normally distributed without any significant outliers because they can really reduce the validity of the results. And then there's also equal variance. So basically the amount of variation amongst the scores in the different conditions or groups should be roughly comparable. That means the conditions or groups should really have equal variance. Now how that looks like depends a bit whether you run it between or within subject design. So for independent or between subject designs, it's really about the homogeneity of variances. So these assumptions can be a little violated except when the groups will have an equal number of subjects. That's when you know, no worse and other tests aren't as flexible or robust against violations of the homogeneity of variance assumption. You can always test for that with Levine's test for the homogeneity of variances. Now the equivalence of homogeneity of variance for between subject designs is really the sphericity for repeated measures or within subject designs. So what that really means is that the variances of the differences between all the combinations of related groups should be equal. So if these violations are, uh, sorry, if these assumptions are violated, that really can increase the type one error. So meaning detecting a significant result when there really isn't one. So you can test this with Moshley's test for sphericity one thing to keep in mind is you basically only need to test this if you have three or more different uh, levels. So sphericity is always met if you only have two levels of the repeated measures factor. So keep that in mind. So if you, let's say, only have a two by two design, then you don't need to test for sphericity because you need at least three different uh, factor levels uh, for needing to actually run that test. So let's get a bit more into details and some examples. So here's just an example to show how just one outlier here, this one really can affect the means quite a bit. So here's the mean with the outlier, here's the mean without the outlier, but still you can't just remove a data point just because you think it uh, doesn't fit your hypothesis or your hopes. So the other question I want to go into is really the assumption of normality and when it really matters the most, because it actually does quite depend on the kind of data experimental designs that you have. So it matters in small samples, but then the central limit theorem really allows you to forget about this assumption for a larger sample. So once you have more than 30 or so participants, then the normality assumption doesn't really matter as much because at least theoretically, the distribution should approach normality. So basically in practical terms, as long as your sample is fairly large, outliers are much more pressing concern than normality. But as just mentioned, you can just delete the outliers because they don't confirm your hypothesis. If you do something about IELTS, you need to really have a systematic and reliable method for removing outliers that actually state in your analysis, in your paper, that is reproducible. So here's just another example, basically. So for uh, simple correlation. So if you just have one 
data point that is a bit outside, it really changes the correlation quite a bit, especially if you don't have huge amounts of data. So how do you actually spot normality? So there's various ways you can do this. So typically we don't really have access to the actual sampling distribution. So we usually just test on the observed data because that's typically all we can do. And keep in mind the central limit theorem. So if you have more than 30 or so participants, the sampling distribution should arguably be fairly normal anyways. So one of the things you can do is basically look at graphical displays like the PP plot or QQ plot and see whether they align with the diagonal here. You can of course also look at the histogram and normal fit and then you can also just run a simple test to see whether that works. That's fairly easy in most software. You can also look at the values of the SKU and kurtosis. So uh, it should be zero in a normal distribution and you can always convert to Z values by dividing the values by the standard error. And of course you can run a Kolmogorov Smirnov test, also sometimes known as the vodka test, to test if the, really, the data really differ from the normal distribution. Keep in mind you shouldn't really use this for very large samples. Uh, because then small differences will be significant. But for very large samples, you uh, should really have a fairly normal distribution anyways. And keep in mind, in small samples, big differences won't really be significant that easily. Another aspect to look into is uh, the homogeneity of variances. So the simplest way is really to take a quick look at the data and see whether the variances between the different items here differs. Here you see the individual data, or you can uh, look at the uh, error bars basically. So this is a nice way of uh, doing a first quick visual test. If you want a formal test, you can use things like Levine's test that really tests whether the variances in different groups are really the same. Keep in mind, for a very large sample, small differences can already be significant, and very small sample, big difference won't necessarily be significant. So one of the things you can do is use more robust, te robust tests like the Welsh T or F value, and you can work with adjusted standard errors. Okay, but so what do you do actually when you have some bias in there in the data? So there's various things you can do about this. One possibility is always to try and analyze with more robust methods. So you could do something like bootstrapping or use methods based on medians and trims. We'll go over that a bit more in the next slides. Uh, so you can trim the data. So basically delete a certain amount of scores from the extreme sides. You can do wintering. So basically substituting outliers with the highest value that isn't an outlier. It's a bit different than trimming because you don't reduce the amount of data, but you just replace the extreme outliers with the less extreme values. You can try to transform the data by applying some kind of mathematical function to the scores. Just, just keep in mind that that actually changes the way you analyze the data and what the results really mean. And in general, you can run non-parametric statistics, which are often based on rank ordering the data to eliminate the effect of outliers and all kinds of biases you might observe. So let's go into some examples. Let's start with bootstrapping. So let's assume you want to have a mean and some confidence interval for the mean, but you're a bit worried that your data might be noisy. So let's say this is your original data here. So in bootstrapping, what you basically do is you draw multiple times from the original a data set, you draw this randomly, put this in a box. So here, for example, draw 10 times from this one here and from this you can create a mean. Now, this is where you need a computer because then in bootstrapping you do this multiple times. This could be thousands of times. So you always come up with a slightly different mean value. Then you can sort this. This gives you also a really good estimate of the mean itself, but you can also use this to come up with a confidence interval for the mean. So it's obviously a little bit more complicated but the, uh, than this, but this is kind of the main idea of bootstrapping. So it can be quite useful in case you have some kind of outliers or biases in the data. Now another simpler method you can use is trimming the data. So the idea is there you sort your data 
here and you trim, let's say 5% from each side. So you basically just delete the outside outliers from each side. And then you can have uh, different kinds of trims, like a, say 5%, 10% or 20%, depending on how much of the data you actually trim and throw away. And the important part is that you always trim equally from both sides. Well, as you can imagine, one of the challenges with this trimming is that you actually reduce the amount of data you have because you literally throw it away. So another thing you can do is called windsoring, where basically instead of throwing it away, uh, you take the next value inwards, basically. So you delete, let's say, the outer 20% of the data and replace them by the value that is not windsored away. So this one is called windsoring. So another thing you can do apart from trimming the data, so throwing away the outliers or replacing them in windstring, is also transforming the original data. But be aware of that. It's, it can be quite tricky, but let's go a bit into this. So you basically, to transform the data, you apply some kind of mathematical function to the scores that makes the distribution look more normal. So for example, for log transformation, uh, you basically can use this to reduce positive skew. Uh, so if before the transformation it looks like that, then afterwards it looks a bit more normal. Another one you can use also to reduce positive skew is square root uh, transformations, so square root of x, which can also be useful for stabilizing variances. So it looks quite nice and normal after that. Or you could use a reciprocal transformation, so basically one over x. That can also reduce the impact of larger scores. And uh, again, this looks a lot more normal here. However, for all of these transformations, it's a bit critical because what you're really doing is testing something different than you originally intended. So already in 1966, Games and Lucas mentioned that transforming the data, the data helps as often as it might actually hinder the accuracy of the F. So in 1984, or games actually put forth a couple of different observations and concerns with data transformation. So one is the central limit theorem. So basically, if you have more than 80 samples, the sampling distribution should arguably be fairly normal anyways. Maybe more critical part is that transforming the data actually changes the kind of hypothesis you're testing statistically. For example, when you use a log transformation, instead of comparing means as or arithmetic means, what you're actually doing is comparing geometric means. Now, is that really what you wanted? So just be aware. Now, the concern is that for small samples, it's actually kind of tricky to determine normality anyways. And Games concludes that the consequences for the statistical model of applying a wrong or unsuitable transformation could actually be a lot worse than the consequence of analyzing the untransformed scores. So in some, just be very cautious about transformation and maybe, unless you really know what you're doing and why you're doing, maybe just don't do this and use some of the other methods. Now finally, how do you actually test for all the different assumptions? So for SPSS, there's really a lot of underlying resources and same, uh, same for many of the other popular programs. For Jump, there's slightly less. So we actually ended up creating our own um, kind of how-tos on how to do this. This is listed on our website here if you wanted to take a closer look. So we have basically put together a couple of different tools and uh, tips and tricks and how to's. So for example, if you wanted to see how we test assumptions in Jump, then it's basically a simple blog entry that we wrote and put together. If you find any errors, please let us know. So it basically goes over the main assumptions, tells you how to do this. Um, the black ones are the key ones. The uh, other ones uh, you can basically tell by just looking at the data easily. And then for the different ones, we go into a bit more detail on how you could actually do this. All right, I hope this was useful. Thanks for watching. And as usual, feel free to comment and give feedback. I'm available at ispacelab.com.